KTBS 8's Jenny Day. Welcome to Around San Diego. I'll get you caught up on a week's worth of news and look ahead in just 30 minutes. So it is finally official. Major League Soccer is coming to San Diego. This will be the league's 30th team. MLS and the new owners announced the big news about the expansion team at Snapdragon Stadium. We know the team won't officially be kicking off until 2025, but people around San Diego are already excited. CBS 8's Kirsten Holmes was out at the announcement on Thursday morning. My friends, San Diego is a sports town, am I right? And just like that, what was once not a sports town becomes... We are soccer city. That is what San Diego is. With the wildly popular National Women's Soccer League representing in San Diego through the Wave FC and the San Diego Loyal FC, who also call Snapdragon home, Carrie Coppich with the San Diego Tourism Authority says we're ready. Between San Diego and Tijuana and the amount of viewers and players and fans, it'll be fantastic for our community. The Loyal is unbelievable and the Wave is unbelievable. Believable, and this just adds another thing. Jerry Sanders, former San Diego mayor and police chief, says nobody thought that we could build Snapdragon. Nobody thought that San Diego State would take over this property. Certainly, nobody thought we were going to get MLS, and it's all coming true. With our cross-border, uh, um, you know, cultural issues, mm -hmm. this is just perfect for it. I mean, we've got people from both sides of the border who are going to be here all the time, cheering for each other. San Diego Loyal sent a message saying they're committed to growing soccer in the city, saying, "quote." Our plan is simple. We aren't going anywhere. So when it comes to this new MLS expansion team, let me ask you the real question. What do you hope the name will be? I, don't, I, don't. I have no idea about the name, but I'm excited to hear what it'll be. Any thoughts on a name? <laughs> I have a few ideas, but I the, the team and the ownership, particularly Saquon, have been very clear that they want to engage the community in this. And because we are working for you, we got the answer straight from the horse's, I mean, owner's mouth. The name's not yet decided like uh, we're doing some studies and focus groups just to see what's the best name, what's the best colors, what people want here because this is your team. That'll be fun to find out. Kirsten, thanks. Well, also this week it became official. Nathan Fletcher's resignation from the County Board of Supervisors took effect at 5 o'clock Monday night. Ahead of his resignation, Fletcher released a long letter to his constituents. Our Brian White went through it line by line with one of Fletcher's biggest political rivals. That's right, Nathan Fletcher has officially resigned from his seat on the County Board of Supervisors, and he says he's out of rehab, according to a lengthy statement he released today. Take a look. Hallelujah, I'm glad it's over. Let this sideshow be a thing of the past. In a statement Monday, Fletcher says, the last 45 days of treatment have been some of the hardest of my life. I had to confront my own failings and flaws, along with working for the first time to address issues of childhood trauma, post-traumatic stress, and alcohol abuse. You know, this was all a ruse, the, uh, you know, going into rehab and everything else. Supervisor Jim Desmond, skeptical of his former colleague and of the timing, going into rehab six weeks ago while this whole scandal was blowing up amidst allegations of sexual misconduct from former MTS employee Gracia Figueroa. Had he been able to negotiate a settlement with her the day before, we probably would never heard anything about this and there would have been no PTSD and would have been no you know, rehab. Fletcher's statement goes on to say, I own unequivocally the responsibility for making the mistake of engaging in consensual interactions with someone outside of my marriage. While no one is without flaws and mistakes, I fully accept that I did not live up to the standard and my resignation is appropriate. You put your faith in me as your elected representative and I let you down. For that, I am truly sorry. It's basically a 600 word manifesto he just sent out today blaming other people for this. Uh, he did, you know, say he was sorry, which was good, but you know, the, you, you got to remember how this whole thing originated. Regarding the accusations against him, Fletcher said, I am confident that when all communications are made public, including written messages and voice recordings, and the interactions and exchanges are fully revealed in a court of law, the truth will present a very different reality. As a married man, my actions were unquestionably inappropriate, but they were consensual and often initiated by the plaintiff. Moving forward, a special election will be held in August for the now empty District 4 seat. We're anticipating a hand full of people probably running for that seat and if nobody gets a 50 percent then it goes to, to a november election a special election like this costs about two and a half million dollars and if no one wins it outright with over 50 percent of the vote then a november runoff will cost taxpayers another two and a half million brian white cbs 8. 
Brian, thank you for that update. Continuing coverage now, the once hundreds of migrants we saw at this section of the border wall are no longer there. CBS 8's Ariana Cohen has an update on one of our other top stories. It looks much different today. It's empty. As you can tell, all that's left is tents and other items as hundreds of migrants have been transported to processing centers. What once had crowds of migrants at the border wall is now vacant. I talked with Pedro Rios, the director of the human rights organization American Friends Service Committee. Approximately, I would say there were between 300 to 400 people that uh, the agency picked up from here and took them over to the port of entry. As far as what happens next, volunteers here tell me they've sent a lot of these items to migrants in Hakumba and other nearby shelters. Last week, an Afghani on the terror watch list was arrested in Otay Mesa, according to Supervisor Jim Desmond's office. The FBI declined to comment to CBS 8 for further information. Rios blames Border Patrol for all of this mayhem and says this could have been avoided. Well, I think for me the biggest issue is that the Border Patrol was not complying with the national standards of how they should uh, treat people once they're under custody and that they were using this space as a de facto pre-processing pre -processing center uh, that was in violation not only of the national standards but that was placing people at great risk of harm. There was dehydration. I saw a, a child who I had to ask Border Patrol to pick up because this eight-month child was no longer feeding from, from her mother was throwing up and the child looked uh, dehydrated. And that was after being here for three days. So this was creating a, a situation that was endangering the lives of people. Meanwhile, volunteers are still trying to help. These women drove in from Oceanside to drop off more items without knowing there wouldn't be any migrants here today. They come here because they want a better life, right? It's good that I don't see the people. I will feel much, much more worse right now, but um, I'm glad somebody's doing something. Ariana Cohen, CBS 8. Well, Tennessee Representative Justin Jones met with California lawmakers earlier this week. You may remember he made national headlines when he was expelled from the Tennessee state legislature after calling for gun reform on the chamber floor. Our political reporter Morgan Reiner has reaction from both sides on this issue. It's not unusual for California to call out other red states. Our governor does it on a daily basis, but this time, the assembly Republican leader stood up in support, saying, practice what you preach. Listen to the minority party in your state. Tennessee State Representative Justin Jones honored on the California assembly floor Monday afternoon. <laughs> Jones and his colleague Justin Pearson were both expelled from the legislature for protesting for more gun safety laws after the school mass shooting in Nashville. Their colleague, Rep. Gloria Johnson, was not expelled for participating. They thought they could bury us underneath their system, but what they really did was water and plant seeds that are flourishing in this nation yes. of a movement. The local districts in Tennessee voted to reinstate the two. Thousands of miles away from his district, he said California plays a role. This issue is not just a single state issue. It's not an issue of one community, but we see what happened in Island, Texas. We see what is going on here in our own communities with, with the everyday gun violence that we're facing. Lawmakers then voted on a resolution to denounce Tennessee's actions. Republican Assembly Leader James Gallagher stood up in support. The message of Representative Jones is not just for Tennessee. It's for you. It's for everybody in this room. He's in the super minority in Tennessee. He's trying to get his ideas heard. He's passionate about them. I am too. You know, I'm, I'm about ready to get a megaphone and come onto this floor when it comes to these crisis issues like wildfire and fentanyl and kids dying every week right now as we speak and not seeing the urgency that I think is needed. That's not really my style, but I guess I can expect if I do, I hope that you guys live up to your preaching. Gallagher and Republicans didn't ultimately vote for the resolution to pass, but they didn't vote against it either. So what exactly is Jones calling for in Tennessee and beyond? Universal background checks, a ban on high-capacity magazines, more red flag laws. 
California already has all of those in place. Now, while California definitely still sees gun violence and mass shootings, according to the CDC, California has one of the lowest firearm mortality rates, while Tennessee is near the top. That was our Morgan Reiner there reporting across the border now in Tijuana. At least 27 people were hurt after an explosion at a building Tuesday morning. It happened around 930, just a few miles south of the San Ysidro port of entry. The explosion prompted a huge turnout of first responders and rescuers. Officials say the building housed several small businesses and above the shops were apartments that were not supposed to be occupied. First responders say they were able to get everyone out of the building building safely. Meanwhile, a man is in custody facing a murder charge after a deadly shooting at Camp Land by the Bay. It happened Tuesday night around 10 o'clock near the Mission Bay RV Parks community swimming pool. Investigators say two men got into a verbal fight, then one left and came back with a gun. Police say 38 year old Michael Callahan shot the 49 year old victim in the chest and took off. Callahan was found a short time later in his motor home. Well, we are also learning a man killed in a motorcycle crash last weekend was as a captain for San Diego Fire. The department identified Captain Darren Austin as the sole victim in this crash. It happened late Sunday night in Escondido. He later died at the hospital. Captain Austin worked for the department for 32 years. His most recent assignment was at the San Diego International Airport. He also served as a Navy CB reservist for nearly 30 years. Plans for a memorial Memorial are coming together, but no details just yet. Captain Austin was just 55 years old. Yeah, and wow, take a look at this. This is what it looked like Tuesday morning in Hillcrest after a semi truck hit a fire hydrant, leaving the parking lot of Ralph's and Trader Joe's on University Avenue flooded. San Diego fire crews were there and were eventually able to shut off that valve after about 40 minutes. The water was seen shooting more than 50 feet into the air. Some even spilled over the embankment, causing a small mudslide onto the 163. Luckily, no injuries, though, or nearby damage was reported. Well, now to progress being made toward reopening Harborside Park in Chula Vista. It was shut down last year after families living in the area complained about homeless encampments that kind of took over the park. The city council plans to discuss a plan to partially reopen the park. Chula Vista's mayor says that they plan to reopen the basketball courts, plant grass, and then set up a park ranger station. To make sure that we have eyes on the parks so they can enforce the rules and make sure that their families and children are welcome. Yeah, the mayor there says he's hopeful the city's new homeless shelter will prevent people from sleeping in the park. Well, the San Diego City Council voted the city should sue SeaWorld for $12 million owed in past due rent plus fees and interest. City officials say SeaWorld owed $10 million from their 2020 lease agreement. The city held off collecting it then because of the pandemic. They say they first warned SeaWorld of the balance last year, but the park still hasn't paid despite record revenues. We reached out to SeaWorld, but we have not yet heard back. Well, there's no question more housing is needed in San Diego, but a homeowner in Normal Heights says the project going up next door to his house is definitely not the answer. He believes the city has illegally approved a serious fire danger. CBS 8 Steve Price is working for you, taking a closer look at his concerns. How can this possibly be legal? There are just 17 and a half inches between Charles Brock's chimney and the ADU being built next door. Charles turned to the city for help, but they said this is permitted. When Charles first saw construction starting next door, he didn't give it much thought. They tore down the garage that had been there. Um, and I was like, just doing something, none of my business. Then he got a call from the contractor that a fence he thought was on the property line was actually off by more than a foot and was coming down. His neighbor planned to build a new ADU right up to the new line. It's very upsetting, let, let there be no mistake. I, I, my wife and I have lost countless hours of sleep for the last year. 
working for you, we discovered that current codes wouldn't allow this to happen. Two-story ADUs now have to have at least a four-foot side yard setback, but the permit for this construction was submitted before that went into effect, making it legal. That said, there's another problem, and it surrounds Charles's chimney. The code says that a chimney has to be two feet above any structure within 10 feet. Clearly, his chimney is below the new structure and nowhere close to 10 feet away. The city acknowledges this new structure violates that code, but a senior structural engineer said as long as they covered the exterior with 7 eighths inch stucco, it would classify the wall as one hour fire resistive. And for the proposed construction, that is satisfactory and code compliant. But Charles says he's worried his next wood burning fire will cause both homes to catch fire. I don't object to her building an ADU. I just object to her building an ADU that that um, imposes upon me a risk of continuing to use, enjoy my home the way that I had intended. So what can you do to protect yourself from a similar situation? As soon as you notice construction in your neighborhood, take a look at the building permits on the city's development services department website. And if there is no permit, report it to the city's building and land use division. We posted links to both websites in this story on our website. Working for you, Steve Price, CBS 8. Whew, interesting one for sure, Steve, thanks. Now to another working for you. A concerned mother is searching for answers after she says three people, including a child, have been hit by cars around Westwood Elementary School in Rancho Bernardo. The mother did not want to identify her herself, concerned that her children might be punished for speaking up about these traffic concerns, but the mom says the tipping point happened right there in the school parking lot. She says she saw an ambulance, a fire truck, and police cars but was told it was nothing. We shouldn't be worried about dropping off our kids to school that they're gonna get hit by a car. Yeah, we contacted the Poway Unified School. The Westwood Elementary principal says there was a minor accident in the parking lot and as a precaution, emergency crews responded, but medical attention was not needed. We also contacted the Rancho Bernardo Community's Council President, who told us that they have requested a traffic study by the city to potentially install rectangular rapid flashing beacons around that area. And every day, really, we are working for you here at CBS 8. If you have anything you'd like us to look into, email us at workingforyou at cbs8.com. Well, the next time you're going through family heirlooms, you may want to take a closer look. Two San Diego families who didn't know each other say they uncovered ancient artifacts. CBS 8's Abby Black shares this fascinating discovery and how they're now being preserved. The families who found these pre-Hispanic artifacts say that they had no idea their stories were more than 2,000 years old. They could have cashed in big, but they say the right thing to do was return them to Mexico. Growing up, Pete and Christine McCallis had heard their mom tell the story about the ancient artifacts that were locked up in this glass case in their childhood living room in Glendora. And she would show them to people, and of course she would say they were Mayan, Mayan, but she didn't really know. Their mom, Bess, would tell the story about her friend Blanca, who was a dressmaker and lived in Nayarit, Mexico. She had unearthed these artifacts while digging to build a house. So Blanca needed surgery and said to my mom, would you like to buy my pieces? And my mom thought, well, I'll pay a couple, couple thousand for them. Bess is now 97 and in assisted living, but her kids never stopped chipping away for the real story behind these clay bowls. Eventually, Christine did a manganese test, which is used to identify ancient art. We thought a couple hundred years old. All the while, Norm Morthman, a storage facility manager in Rancho Bernardo with no relation to the McCallises, uncovered similar artifacts. His parents had had them for 50 years in a glass case, but he never knew their story. Things boxed up from my parents. They made a few calls to a local college, museums, a fine arts appraiser, and then the Consulate General of Mexico in San Diego. I go, what? They're 3,000 years old? San Diego's Consul General of Mexico, Carlos Gonzalez Gutierrez, worked with the Mexican Ministry of Culture and National Institute of Anthropology and History to analyze the 64 artifacts. They are from the pre-Hispanic era. It was quite a discovery. Archaeologists found the cajetes, pedestal-shaped vases, and other artifacts belonged to the three Mesoamerican time periods dating back to 300 B.C. to 900 A.D. 
They are invaluable, they are priceless. Um, the important thing is that uh, they were always part of our nation. The Consulate General says the Mexican Ministry of Foreign Affairs will assist in conserving the artifacts. Oh, we're just glad they're, they found their way home. We hope it inspires more people to do this. In Little Italy, I'm Abby Black, CBS 8. Really so cool to see. Abby, thanks for sharing. Well, an Oceanside Elementary School teacher who goes beyond the call of duty had no idea what was waiting behind her. In this Zebeli zone, Jeff visits Impressa Elementary for the big reveal. We're at a school assembly that's about to begin with a special surprise behind that curtain. Students at Impressa Elementary are enjoying a lesson about the importance of water. We have one more surprise. Their principal, Kim Hollowell, is calling for unexpected showers of gifts by asking the kids to turn around. How many of you know who I am? Carly Harris from the San Diego Honda dealers had a favor to ask. I need you to help me find something, all right? So let's get our binoculars out. Can you do that? Okay, everyone, I need your help finding Mrs. Boca. Where is she? Oh, she's right here. Behind that curtain, Piles of school supplies and a 75-inch teaching screen were waiting. The San Diego Honda dealers are thrilled to announce you as one of our very deserving winners of $5,000 of brand new school supplies. Mrs. Boca was nominated for the Teacher Appreciation Award for taking special care of her second grade student, Quincy Bergdahl. Quincy's been battling leukemia. And instead of him falling behind in school, Mrs. Boca, after teaching a full day in her classroom, went to Quincy's home to keep him caught up. I just couldn't say no. While Quincy fought off cancer and received a bone marrow transfer from his brother Reese, Mrs. Boca delivered lessons in math, reading, and compassion. What started out as something that I thought was gonna be really hard actually ended up being really joyful, and it brought back more than what I gave. He's pretty, he's a pretty cool kid. Quincy's parents, Andrew and Teresa, agree. She changed our lives. She changed Quincy's life. She became part of the family, for sure. She was so dedicated to Quincy. She was just a bright light for his recovery. Mrs. Boca also received a $400 Amazon gift card. And to top it all off, you're on television. In the Zevely Zone. Let's hear it for Mrs. Boca! <laughs> Jeff Zevely, CBS 8. Well, May is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. We are celebrating by highlighting some of San Diego's many AAPI-owned businesses. Today, we're featuring the Smackin' Guamanian Grill. The owner, Christian Graham, tells us what the focus of his restaurant is. Guamanian food is from the island of Guam. Um, over here at Smackin, uh, Smackin actually stands for Pseudo Mesa Authentic Chamoa Kitchen. And so we try to focus and emphasize on the authentic tastes and flavors of Guam. Um, yes, please. So Graham says all the recipes at his restaurant are his grandmother's and have been passed down through his family. Well, hey, there's another lion at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. This is Bo exploring his new habitat at the lion camp. He's seven years old and came from the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo in Colorado. The zoo plans to have Bo eventually lead his own pride. He'll be introduced to the female lions who also reside at lion camp Malika, Zuri, and Amira. The zoo says guests can visit Bo. For now, he'll rotate on and off habitat with the lionesses until they are comfortable with each other. 
Well, if you suffer from back or neck pain, you may see a chiropractor for help. But what about sending your dog to one? Animal chiropractic care is becoming more and more popular as pet owners look for holistic health care options for their fur children. CBS 8's Kelly Hesedal saw firsthand what happens at, at an appointment like this and what you need to know before taking your pet to one. I'm going to do some manual palpation and I'm just running my hands over her muscles, different joint regions. I'm looking for symmetry. I'm looking to make sure that the muscle tone feels the same on both sides. My name is Dr. Mindy Marr. I'm a board certified animal chiropractor. I'm also a certified chiropractic sports physician. Dr. Mindy Marr practices in San Diego. So what is animal chiropractic care? It's a branch of animal health care that specializes essentially in manual or physical rehab of an animal's spine or extremity joints. Who is your client typically? Is it someone that's, is it a dog that's older usually? Is it someone with hip issues? It's a variety. I do have a lot of geriatric dogs and cats that come see me to help manage their osteoarthritis or their spondylosis conditions. But she also sees younger dogs as well as agility and sports dogs, what she often finds. A pet parent will reach out to me and say, out of nowhere, their dog is no longer wanting to jump into the car or they're having trouble going up and down the stairs. She says while animal chiropractic care can definitely help with that, it's best used for preventing issues in the first place. There are seven bones in the neck region. I'm feeling for how they're moving in various different directions, side to side, up and down. She walks me through what an appointment looks like. Sage is a 13 year old yellow lab. So I'm gonna take a 45 degree angle right here and we're gonna go one, two, three. Good girl. So I try to get the dog to move their head on their own so that I'm not forcing it. Hey, buddy. But is animal chiropractic care necessary? I definitely think it has the potential to be beneficial pending the diagnosis. B Street Veterinary Hospital vet, Dr. Jenna Olson. Alternative therapies have a great role in conjunction with typical Western medicine. So in conjunction with medication or in conjunction with surgery or physical therapy. The laws vary by state. In California, you need a referral from a vet before you can bring your pet to an animal chiropractor. They can't speak. They can't tell us if they're uncomfortable or if that was really stressful or if they were super nervous. And chiropractic has the potential to be really dangerous if done with the wrong force, at the wrong angle, with the wrong timing. It's important to find a board certified animal chiropractor and that can be a doctor of chiropractic or a doctor of veterinary medicine. Right there and right at end range is a light little push. Good girl. Good girl, huh? Dr. Katie Kangas is Sage's owner. She also owns one of the clinics Dr. Marr works at. I love to call her my anti-aging poster child because she can literally hike 10 to 15 miles without a problem. And while chiropractic care can't extend your pet's life by 50 years or anything like that, Dr. Marr says it can do this. Part of living a quality life is being as pain-free as possible and it's being as mobile as possible. And it's being able to get up comfortably, walk outside, do your business outside and you know, just be able to, to, to do daily life activities. Enjoying quality time together. Kelly Hesedal, CBS 8. Well, our winter storms appear to have had a positive effect when it comes to our bee population. In this Earth 8 report, our Sean Stiles spoke with a local beekeeper about what this means for our ecosystem. After years of drought, bee populations had been decimated, but this winter brought record rain and a super bloom. That meant lots of pollen, nectar, and bee populations have rebounded. We've got a really robust colonies here. They're exploding with bees coming and going every couple of seconds. You know, you could, you could look at almost 10 bees per second coming in and out of these hives. Travis the Wolf is the head the beekeeper for Bee Leaf USA and says the return of these healthy the hives is a direct cause from the super bloom and the abundance of food from all the flowers. So health-wise, the bees are doing very, very, very good. We have seen different flowers that typically do not pop up simply because we are in such a drought area of California. But this winter's record range changed 
changed all of that, and the bees are benefiting mm -hmm. twofold. In fact, what it's done is it's helped the increase the populations first. So bees being our overall collector of nectar, the populations shot up right after those rains, and now they're in this massive honey collection time where we're seeing a lot of the bees are just storing it away, storing it away, so it, it's wonderful to see at this point. Bees are usually brought in as pollinators for different crops, mm -hmm. but this year with the super bloom, Wolf says expect to see a lot of wildflower honey. So that will force the bees to gain all of that extra food from right there and thus shooting up the wildflower uh, honey that we see on the shelves, that we see on the roadsides, uh, and ultimately see at the farmers markets and stuff like that. For bees to make honey is no easy task. First, the bees collect nectar using their tongues and store it in their stomachs where digestive enzymes start the honey making process. When the bee returns to the hive, they transfer the nectar to another bee. This is done multiple times to get more enzymes in the nectar. The enzymes help turn the nectar into fructose and glucose. At this point, the liquid is put into the honeycomb, and then the bees beat their wings like little fans to help evaporate nearly 80% of the moisture. A wax cap is put on top for the final transformation to honey. Incredible, right? Besides the abundance of honey, the healthy hive will split and swarm to make a new colony. So the first initial queen will be the one to leave initially with the swarm of bees. They'll, she'll leave with about 40 to 60 percent, kind of depends on the time of day and the amount of bees that can fly with her. The reason the queen leaves the hive is overcrowding, too much honey, or looking for a new food source. We'll see both as the back country dries out. A lot of those locations are most likely going to be the sort of urbanized areas where we're seeing manicured gardens, manicured plants, and essentially people are watering all of their uh, plants and food and stuff like that. Some of those bee swarms will make their way west looking for that perfect microclimate with abundant nectar. We expect to see a lot of them all through kind of the just the west side of the 15 right there uh, as you're going up the highway, um, kind of before you drop back down into the coastal. Areas. So the next phase of this record rain and super bloom, these bees are going to be heading west with a swarm. And if they do end up in your garden, bee leaf will help you relocate that hive to a safer place. Sean Stiles, Earth 8. That truly is incredible. Sean, thank you. And it is so beautiful out there thanks to those bees. As always, thank you to you for your time. Thanks for staying informed. Join me each week as I take you around San Diego. For CBS 8, I'm Jenny Day. Take such good care.